Welcome, Deborah Shepes, to the iMarket Podcast. So good to have you here today. I'm really excited about this episode uh, because we're going to be discussing one of the most profound, or my favorite book that I've actually read this year, which is Shift, a Marketing Rethink by PhD. So to get started, Deborah, can you tell us why PhD, you know, put this book together? There's a lot of work and research that has gone into it. Uh, why? Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Um, I think this is our seventh or eighth book as PhD. Um, PhD, part of the, the Omnicom Media Group for those who aren't familiar. And we have to do thought leadership because we have to be thinking about the future all the time. So all of the books have been looking at um, how to help brands, how to help our clients, but the orientation overwhelmingly is about the future and how to adapt. And I, I think it's a reality all of us find ourselves in that the pace of change is just accelerating. So shift is about a big shift that's happened and we'll talk about the t that today and also about the future and, and what we can do to to prepare for it. Absolutely. And, and other than you know, COVID sort of disrupting a lot of things, not just in marketing, but in various um, fields. What would you say has been you know, some of the key shifts that have happened in marketing that, that uh, we need to be aware about? So, I mean, without beating around the bush, I think it's the, the digital revolution that Shift focuses on. And I mean, I've been in the industry for more than two decades, so I can speak quite um, kind of personally about the shift between an analog world and a digital world and what that's meant for marketers and how challenging it's been to shift. Um, I worked for many years in South Africa and it, it seemed to take a long time for media and marketing to follow the consumer into the digital world. And then when we did, um, oh boy, it just, it just accelerated. Um, it just um, kind of the short term metrics, which is a lot of what the the books about and what we'll talk about today were so seductive to marketers um, that they kind of overwhelmed them. So, so the shift that we're talking about is digital, largely the consumers increasing um, reliance and, on an interest in digital and how marketers have responded to that, how they've had to respond to that and some of the errors in the ways um, around those responses. I mean, let me make, maybe go back a step and, and talk about what shift you can count that says has happened um, to marketers and the book talks about this Cambrian explosion um, of digital and all of the big changes that have happened and it says that as a result of this marketers find themselves in what it terms a midlife crisis and that's the kind of that's the scenario that it, it lays out as a starting point and then looks to try and solve it and I think if I think of my own experience um, in media and marketing, one of the reasons that we fell into a midlife crisis as a marketing industry is we've long, or I think many senior marketers have long had a kind of a sense of inadequacy in executive boardrooms because unlike their colleagues, um, they just didn't have the data to justify their activities or their spends. And marketing has, of course, long been one of the softer areas in board packs. And so this influx of performance metrics that came from digital um, and consumers interacting with our digital media um, and comms, not just having reach metrics for once, but actually having an understanding of, of what was happening, um, kind of what the impact was, was, as we said just now, in incredibly seductive. And we could start proving our worth in those boardrooms. We could start course correcting in real time. It was like a fast feedback loop for um, for the first time. And I mean, in South Africa, again, referring to my experience there, um, I think some of this was held back because of the high cost of data um, and it just took forever to properly take hold. But once it did, it, it was addictive. So as marketers, we started charting our metrics from the rooftops. We were proving ourselves everywhere uh, with, with what we were getting from digital. And it, in retrospect, it's easy to see how we fell into traps, um, probably kind of two main areas of traps. The first being that we lost sight of the full picture of marketing. I mean, marketing is about everything from um, from from pricing to to where your product is. And we became very focused on the last click conversion. Um, and that is 1% of the story about how the consumer 
connects to the brand. That moment of clicking has got so much before it. So much comes before it um, in their mind. And looking at only that one last click, because that's the data you have, um, is is dangerous. It creates a dangerous short-termism. And I mean, I think we've made this even worse by setting KPIs and incentivizing people on short-term metrics and on a short-term basis. So in many marketing organizations, you see this. Um, it's a reality that people will make decisions based on how their bonuses are structured. So there will be a very kind of um, um, intense focus on, on, on the short-term delivery without a full picture of creating brand demand um, over the long term. And the second trap I think we fell into was we stopped seeing our consumers as people. I mean, marketing is the most fascinating of industries to be in because you've got all the data, but you've also got these human beings um, who have motivations and dreams and desires. And we stopped seeing that full picture and just started seeing them as numbers. So I would say we are in a full a full blown midlife crisis as, um, as marketers. Um, and we were yearning for kind of those slower, more consistent metrics that told the same story. Um, we're starting to wake up and and see the balance that's that's needed. But the again, the pace of change is so dramatic that it makes it difficult for us to respond. So, Shift says, as a starting premise, we're in a midlife crisis. Um, it makes a lot of sense to me why this has happened. I can see it in my own kind of career and experience this um, this change or I'm trying not to say shift, I'm thinking for other words here. Um, <laughs> and it, it describes, it, it lays out the archetypes and <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know if that's something you want to get into in um, in this podcast, but we could we could talk about that a bit if you like. Absolutely, let's do that. In fact, before we get to the archetypes, I mean, just you know, thinking about what you're saying around the midlife crisis, um, and you haven't, you know, worked um, in in on the continent in Africa. Do you see that that crisis is as pronounced in, you know, a lot of the African markets? This midlife crisis, um, or or would you see? Would you say that maybe we're not, you know, as uh, affected them just because of, you know, maybe data has not been there or you know, the maturity levels in terms of digital media? I, I think, I mean, I think we probably, we ho probably have been as affected. The, so that, I mean, I, I spoke about the cost of broadband and kind of a, a, a slowness to to see the proliferation of digital media in, in South Africa and, you know, in, in some other markets in um, on the continent, that would, that would also be true. But I think marketers by nature, want to prove themselves. They they want to show their relevance. So where there were metrics, I think we we reached out and we we grabbed them. It doesn't matter which um, which country you were sitting in. So I I think it is as true. And if we look at some, um, I mean we don't have time to talk about all of them today. But <clears throat> they all talk about how people have responded to a changing environment. And w one of them the um. The Madonna, if I could just use that as an example, the primary condition of the Madonna is distraction. And I mean, we all know Madonna just reinvents herself like it's been going on for decades. And and with distraction comes like an overfocus on the next big thing um, rather than thinking about the business today. And I think that is as true um, in an organization in Kenya as it is in um, in the US or in or in London. Um, marketers are 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 trying to do the very best that they can and so they're they're reading what they can and they're um, getting the latest in the marketing publications and whatever the next big buzzword is is at risk of overshadowing what the business really needs so lots of reinvention that you know the kind of things that can get you recognition in the marketing world um, but the buzzwords can be at the expense of the actual business and don't think it matters what size the business is either as well as where it is the kind of the, the to continue the Madonna example the practical solution there is to build a measurement framework that links up your business KPIs to the outcomes um, or the marketing outputs and what you're really trying to do is get everybody on the same page and that is I mean that's almost like that's what happens when you put human beings in charge of a lot of money I don't think that is distinct to um, to one market or um, yeah, or to a specific continent. It's true everywhere. And it goes back to what you said earlier around, um, you know, the four P's of marketing that, you know, are we focusing only just on the 
promotional piece, the short term, you know, part of it and not really spending a lot of time on pricing, on product, on distribution. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I think I think we have we've we've lost focus and we've gone for the thing that we can control um the easiest and I mean what we I, I spoke earlier about how we've z- kind of zoned in on the 1% which is the last click. We've zoned in on advertising. Um and I mean one of the one of the things that we talk about a lot at at PhD and that I talk a lot about in my daily life I, I work on um the Agio um, as a brand and the obsession is really about understanding the whole consumer journey and that is across paid owned and earned because your experience of a brand isn't just the advertising you see it's it's how you how it shows up on shelf how it shows up um, in the consumption environment um, sometimes that that on shelf experience is the only experience you'll have with a brand because um, you won't see that because you you know you're a light TV viewer or whatever the case might be um, so that has really got to be, it's got to be on point. It's got to be joined up. Um, yeah, so it's not, I think, not just about the last click. We've, we've got to think a lot more holistically about, in the simplest terms, how to connect brands, our brands, to consumers. And that starts with a proper understanding of the consumer. And as you know, because you do work on the Azure, a lot of things um, to build salience, we, you know, the principles we follow is both mental availability and physical availability. A lot of brands um, in Africa I'll speak about Kenya, um, where the, the brand is physically almost available, you know, almost 100% distribution, and that really helps the salient. So even when, you know, advertising is is paused, it it doesn't have a huge impact. It has it has an impact, but the fact that the brand is physically available, Agreed. and I think we tend to forget that sometimes. Can you tell me about any other archetype archetype that you think you know? We, we fall into um so we spoke about so there's there's five so there's the harry houdini the madonna the donald which is donald trump the king henry the eighth and the christopher columbus and it's they all have their own unique problems they they are the human traps that we fall into and that we're falling into as a result of this change and then they look at um kind of the way to get to get out of it so i spoke about um I spoke about the Madonna and the Madonna's problem is distraction. Um, I love the Donald because um, I think a lot a lot of people are in the trap of the Donald. The thing about the Donald is you know a little bit about something and you think you know everything about it. Um, and it, it links back to the problem with buzzwords um, and people um, kind of latching on to something. Um, so the risk with the Donald is you think you understand something that's fundamental to marketing something like kind of an ipa piece on the long and the short of it or you know baron sharp's work but you actually didn't read the book you've just read like a little summary and and that is that is really dangerous as well not properly understanding um and marketers i mean we are bad we we love buzzwords we love the latest topic and sometimes we lack we are tempted to lack the rigor that 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 is required for for handling large budgets and this big responsibility of connecting brands to consumers. Um, speaking of you know functional capabilities, um, you know you know according to you know research again, but still by you know I think PhD put this out. Forty nine percent of marketing leaders say that knowledge of the latest marketing technology tools um, is the number one skill set that they need their teams to survive you know, in the, in the future. However, only 50% of these leaders say they have little or no knowledge of what these tools can do. So that's quite disarming because we're saying, you know, this is a sort of capability or technical or functional, you know, way we want marketers to go to be able to be relevant for the brands in the future, but uh, that there's a gap in getting there. So what would you say, um, you know, is, what should marketers sort of be aware of in, in accelerating the use of marketing? So there's an amazing video that's narrated in the book. It's narrated by uh, Mark Ritson, who is a kind of a name that many people listening to this will know. Um, and it it's like a, a simulated therapy session. So it's a therapy session, like a marriage counseling session between the brand and the marketer or the um the brand, the marketer, sorry, the 
yeah, the, I suppose the marketer as the best description and the consumer. And the consumer feels that the marketer or the brand has stopped listening to them and stopped seeing the real them because they think they know everything. And why do marketers think they know everything? Because we've got digital metrics. So we're clinging on to that. And at the same time, the marketer feels that the consumer has become increasingly disloyal and has begun seeing other people. And this plays out really like a fraught marriage session. It's kind of brilliantly shot. There's lots of emotion. There's like the tense knuckles and the tight jaw lines. And if you've ever had like a relationship where you felt you needed to talk to somebody, this you'll relate to this video. Um, and the, the biggest take out for me is when the, the consumer says to the marketer, but you're not seeing the full picture of who I am. Um, you are just looking at TikTok metrics and you're not looking at the whole me. You don't understand. I actually still watch TV, linear TV. Um, I consume all sorts of media types. And to what you were saying earlier, um, I, I see the brand in store and that's how I form a perception of it. It's a There's a whole other me. And just because I like someone um, or follow them, uh, on a social media platform doesn't mean that they're an influence on me. It doesn't mean I even agree with them. Sometimes I follow them because they're famous and I want to know what's going on. It, oh, they really aggravate me. It doesn't mean that I'm going to do what they say. So in other words, there's a human behind the data that the marketers are looking at and a much bigger story and motivation is a big, um, a really big, a really big part of that story. So I think kind of to answer your question about um, MarTech, the, the way to think about that is to start with data um, and look at how much data you have in the form of first party data, um, which some um, categories will have a huge amount of and, and some will battle to collect. Um, and how much do you how much could you enrich that with second party data? And then what do you understand about third party data? And I mean, you your starting point again for data is what what you want to do with it, what what do you need to understand about your consumer and, and how could you use data deployed through marketing technology to make your um, to make your marketing better? So if you put the consumer first, you can start to think about what will move the needle for you. I mean, at PhD, we believe, as does Byron Sharp, that we should reach all category buyers at all times. So we're never going to do incredibly tight targeting. And there's a tension when we start talking about MarTech and a temptation to go, well, does that mean we're going to have really, really small um, kind of audiences that we're creating bespoke comms for? The, the digital marketing laser is more about relevance than it is about reach. And that's when it becomes really powerful. So you're going to reach all of the people, but you've got to reach them with the right message in the right context, context, incredibly important word here, um, in the right mindset and, and at the right time. And I think once you've thought about the data that you would need to do that and, and how you can deploy it, then you can look where it's coming from. And that video that I spoke about earlier shows that TikTok is not going to give you the full story. So I'm, I'm just saying TikTok, but you know what I mean? Like looking at, just looking at a couple of digital stats, not going to help you understand that full consumer journey again and and motivation. There are many touch points and there are many data trails that consumers are leaving. So what data beyond the surface of just who they like on Instagram um, can you join up? What different pieces of data that they're leaving behind can you join up to give you the picture of them that you need? Um, and then how can you deploy it again across multiple touch points because these are human beings um, moving through their lives. So I think the answer to any question about uh, MarTech has to be go back a step to data and then go back to the starting point, which must be the consumer. You mentioned the fact that marketers and agencies really need to be consumer first, leveraging data to truly understand the consumers. I feel that consumer first phrase is also you know, a buzzword. What does it really mean to be consumer first? Um, I, and I say that because I think as brands, maybe we're, we think we're consumer first, but we're brand first or organization led. What oh, that is such mean? a difficult question because it is a buzzword. Um, it is a buzzword. I suppose it's, I mean, one of the things that we do as marketers is we completely overestimate the importance of our brands. So any brand out approach assumes that the consumer is completely locked into all of our comms. The reality about consumer first is 
about the individual consumer, but I think it starts with recognizing the reality of someone's life and they are not watching your ad with the greatest of interest. They are thinking about what they're going to have for supper and they're worrying about um, what they have to do at work or what's going on in their lives, their, you know, relationship issues, their kids' issues, whatever it is. I mean, people have got a million things on their mind at any given time and as a brand, you've got to nudge your way into that space. So understanding the consumer, I think, starts with understanding that the consumer cares a whole lot less than we'd like to think. And I mean, that is why broad reach of category starts to make a ton of sense and tight targeting doesn't. Because if you've got lots and lots of people who are um, disloyal, they they do kind of engage with the repertoire of brands and they, they don't just follow you um, fanatically because they love your brand so much. As marketers, we love our brands so much. The consumers are paying much less attention than we think. So that that's probably the starting point. To be consumer first, you have to know that they don't care as much as we'd like to think. Would you say um, the way we are structured, uh, let's get into sort of client agency relationships. Mm. Are the structures of today um, relevant for ensuring that we're consumer first um, with all that's happening with data and technology, the current client agency relationships we have? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I mean, I think the answer is it's changing. Um, in the book shift, uh, Mark Holden, who's the, um, the head of strategy for, for PhD across the globe, speaks about and, and was the main author. Um, he speaks about a much more modular approach being required. Um, and, and one of the concepts that he puts forward is agency as a platform. Um, so he's saying you you shouldn't have like a dedicated set of FTEs on every account. And I mean, the same would apply in a marketing organization on, on the, the client side as opposed to the agency side. You, um, you should have a flexibility um, and you should have a kind of an ability to move people, specialists in and out of teams and deploy them to where they need it the most. So the, the future of the organization, I think, is about being more adaptable. There is a lot in the book about talent, um, talent and skills, and, you know, perhaps we can expand on that. But structurally, the key learning is be able to move people around. So even strategic consulting, he talks about being able to take teams of specialists on and off different pieces of um, kind of project work as they're required so that you've got the best skills rather than just the people that are scoped um, on that particular area of the business. Mark Holden also says in the book, you know, that, um, you know, due to the various shifts that have happened over the last 10 years, um, organizations also need to relook at how they are structured internally. Um, what, what's, what does, what's a book point of view in terms of in-housing versus outsourcing certain functions? Yeah, certain I mean, there's, I think that it depends on, on the organization. I think agencies have often seen clients in housing business as a huge threat. It doesn't have to be. And the perspective in the book on that is you should you should take people from within the agency where those specialist skills are or wherever they might be, because you'd, you'd always have a multitude of agencies and you should have the modularity and the flexibility to be able to second them or, or move them into your organization as you need them and take them out. So it shouldn't be seen by the agency as something that means the business is taking a, being taken away. The lens should be where are the specialist skills most needed and how can we help as the broader collective of client and multiple agencies to resource that and enable that and again bring it in um, and have the flexibility around bringing things in that perhaps we don't have um, as, as they're required as kind of this pace of change continues to accelerate. And and, and still on that topic um, also in the book um, Isabel Massey who's the global media head at Diageo talks about borderless partnerships with um, clients and agencies should have. Um, how, how has PhD been able to achieve this in Africa? Um, and you could use the Azure as an example. Um, yeah, I mean, I think she's talking about exactly that, um, about making sure that you've got the right skills in the right place. To be honest, I can't speak about how that's looking in Africa specifically. I mean, we've seen a number of examples in global um, where people have 
people work for PhD, but they're based at Diageo, where specialist teams are seconded onto um, onto projects. And a couple of really, really big projects going on at the moment, and there was expertise sitting within PhD or within the broader Omnicom group. Um, and again, I mean, not, not to speak specifically about Omnicom, all agency groups would have a number of areas of expertise under under their roof. Um, so it has been about moving, kind of moving those areas in and out um, as needed and building multidiscipline teams as well. Um, so having having people from different specialist areas that are working closely together rather than just coming in um, as kind of spokes on a wheel of a project, but sharing knowledge. Yeah, and I think it speaks to the ability for real agility, especially when, you know, certain, you know, you know, in Africa we work, we always say we work in VUCA environments, very volatile, anything could happen. Yeah. Um, but I think it, it helps with organizations being able to be agile and saying, these are the skill sets or the, the areas where we need, you know, more, uh, more priority versus, you know. Yeah, yeah I mean, just, maybe yeah. we could talk a bit, about, a bit more about the second part of that agility. So the first is structural, um, the modularity and and the second is uh, is skills and and talent and I think I mean we all feel this that we we we're completely intangible asset based businesses in in marketing we all that we've we've really got is kind of our our people we we've got a product at the end of it but what what we have as value is is the talent and the I mean, PhD and kind of the contents of the book show like a, a real seriousness about understanding what change is coming in order to equip us to make the best decisions about talent going forward. So the book talks about how to prepare for the future um, and how we have to start hiring in the right skills now. Um, an example of a role um, that's discussed as a conversational AI developer. So this is something which is embryonic now. It would kind of make it would make sense if I kind of described to you what what a lot of the roles in the book are, and you'd go, well, you know, we've got that, we've we've got that. But you you might have a little bit of it, and and that's right because in in kind of our experience, if you don't see a glimmer of a thing now, it means it's not going to fully come to fruition. Um, so there are glimmers of these things all over the place, but the the opportunity is um, higher in now because that role is going to be in full demand. The need will have become full swing in 12 to 18 months. And if you can equip your company now, um, it's, it's real competitive advantage. I mean, you would be thinking, what 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 are they? Um, and there's a, a huge list of them in the book. A, a lot of them are technology based. So things like a gaming commerce expert or an influencer programmatic team. I mean, those speak to um, becoming better at deploying technology. But there's also this emphasis that you've referred to on more flexible specialization um, and having these teams that can move seamlessly on and off projects rather than being dedicated to one thing. So. You have to keep your eye on the horizon, I suppose, and and HR has to be thinking ahead. I mean, we should be thinking about what's it going to look like in 2025 now and starting to recruit and starting to develop and starting to train. And then I think starting to um, integrate as well um, and get the teams, the rest of the teams on board, get them to understand. It's, I mean, it's one of the things that I think many companies battle with. They've hived digital off into its own little specialization. And then you've got kind of everybody else and digital. But but again, it's about the consumer and the consumer lives across the world. So those everybody else's need to understand what's happening in digital and the digital guys need to understand what the everybody else's are all about. It's, it is one experience that the consumer has at the end of the day. Yeah, that's really interesting in terms of, you know, skills and talent because the traditional marketer you know, was that a traditional marketer, a generalist, and now we're saying the marketer of today, not even tomorrow, uh, should have specialist skills, um, and they're evolving so fast. So like you really need to be, you know, one up, um, you know, to really be relevant to the consumer. Yeah, as and, I said, and difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of yeah. the one of the things the books touch or the book touches on that I think is is very relevant in in our organization and probably right now and. Um, a lot of marketing organizations is retail media or e-com. So you have a team, we have a team of e-com specialists and then we've got everybody else, <laughs> e-com, digital and everybody else. And 
um, Steve Maddow speaks in or writes in um, in the book about how challenging this is, and I, I I went and chatted to him to kind of prepare for this conversation, to understand more about what what he was thinking, and he said it's like a really uncomfortable intersection right now. So we've got this acceleration of retail media, um, and there's a um, kind of a, a meeting point between our largest media platforms and our most strategic re retail partners. And it's a new language for marketeers. It's a new capability for commercial teams. And there are a bunch of questions coming up. Um, and I see it in our day to day. So which team owns the strategy is a question. Um, where does the budget come from? There's a question. So does everybody does the everybody else group allocate a bit of budget to to retail media? Um, you know, wh wh where's that decision made? How do we make sure we're spending the right amount of money? What are the appropriate levels of budget? Um, and how do we get integration right up to the briefing process? So how do we get kind of the commercial opportunity realized right, right up front? And he talks about the fact that we're in an adolescent stage right now. Um, and that kind of the analogy he used when I was talking to him was muscle memory. So he said, we've, we've got scale, we've got successful businesses, um, and they're based on building muscle memory because we do what we know what to do, processes and, and culture. But suddenly we've got this new thing that's getting in the way of, of the muscle memory and the way that everything is always kind of operated. And all, again, all these human beings who don't like change are having to relearn how they do things. And parts of the business want to run at a million miles an hour. Um, but the risk is we kind of trip up or crash over walls. and. It's to be expected because we haven't done this before. So, I mean, his perspective on it is it's a it's a slow process, um, but we've got to embed the learning. We've got to properly embed the learning across the organisation. So again, the everybody else has have to understand um, kind of the Steves, and we've we've got to get the new ways of working into our core business so that we've got muscle memory for the future. If we think of everything new. And, and retail media is probably the biggest new thing right now. Um, as an as an add-on, um, we're in trouble. It's 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 got to become part of the whole. We've got to become fitter. We've got to get muscle memory fit um, and faster. Fantastic. What would you say um, surprised you about the book, or one key takeaway where it was like your yeah, aha moment? Um. I mean, I think some of the I I found the predictions really. Um, really profound. So what PhD did was uh, worked with the Singularity University to understand the big macro forces of change. And I mean, they're listed in the book and they're what you would expect. And they were in the media quite a bit a couple of months ago. So physical ship separation, shallow living, trust dissolution, engineered serendipity, decentralized influence, purpose pervasion. It's, it's all what you would expect. And I think what alarmed me, perhaps, is that a lot of these things sound terrible. They sound like a life that's been broken up into fragments of distraction, continuous distraction with lots of sort of thumb scrolling and, and mindless media consumption. And looking at those six forces of macro change to 2030 and what will impact our consumers um, and, and how we kind of think about them when we try to connect our brands to them. I, I would have hoped, I suppose, that there might be some swing back to a simplicity. There's a swing back to simplicity in the marketing approach that's recommended in that it recommends putting the consumer at the center and trying to holistically understand both the one kind of percent that you understand because of the digital data and the consumer's bigger um, world, which is across different touch points. I would have hoped that the predictions for us and for myself as a consumer weren't one of continued fragmentation, um, but they are. The, the, journey that, the journey that we find ourselves on with complete information overload as consumers is is not going to stop. Given the breadth of touch points that consumers have in this digital age, uh, marketers are now, like you said earlier, flooded with a lot of data points they can use. But how should, you know, what are the relevant KPIs that businesses should be looking at from a long term perspective versus short term? Um, what is really marketing effective? Um, for yeah, I mean, I think you, you need a blend. Um, and there are 
good old brand health metrics. Um, how distinctive are you? How meaningful are you? How salient are you? Uh, those are long term metrics. I mean, that kind of data you'll only see once a year. Um, it's 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 costly. It's in depth. But that speaks to future demand. So that is a long, that's a longer term metric and it speaks about the broader impact of what you've been doing on, on the consumer and, and how you have been connecting the brand to the consumer. I don't think that the digital metrics are irrelevant, not for a second, because they allow you to harvest the demand. The kind of what the, the book recommends is in, in light of the shift that's happened, is that you take you take both sides of the story into account. And at PhD, we've got a model which we call Role for Comms, um, which sits kind of at the heart of all of our strategic thinking. And it looks at what is the communication trying to achieve um, to try and help us think clearly about how to do that. And it's kind of got a lot of neuroscience behind it, um, a lot of cognitive psychology, a lot of understanding of how the brain processes information is baked into it. And so if you're trying to build associations, that you need to do a different thing to the brain um, to the thing that you would do if you're trying to cut through. Um, you're cutting through, you would be kind of trying to jolt or jar it or, you know, do something that makes it stand up and take notice, whereas building associations is is a slower a slower burn. And the, the same media channel can be used in different ways to achieve um, different role for comms. So it's, it's not a case of, oh, well, you know, um, video or digital display is always right for um, impacting. Digital display can work, <coughs> excuse me, in impacting role for comms. So something like a homepage takeover would be an example um, of trying to cut through, achieve cut through, but it can also work for um, pushing people further down the funnel um, and nudging them to, to purchase. So each of those four role for comms that we work with have different KPIs and in the digital display example, you could have um, a, an achieving impact KPI um, linked to a role for comms objective that's trying to cut through. Whereas if you're trying to do um, something in the activating space to generate conversion, your KPI would would be click through. So I think your the the metrics that you look at and the KPIs that you look at need to be balanced short and long term. But as a further build on that, I think you need to think about the role for comms and you would have more than one um, within any campaign and be clear that you're achieving the right um, the right KPIs or chasing the right KPIs for the right um, communications objectives. Very well said, you know, the practical application for marketers is where the challenge is because there are a lot of tensions or that you're working with, um, especially with short term sort of metrics. Um, the marketer is, you know, working in say a certain period there's a certain you know KPI that they want to achieve. So sometimes looking at more longer term KPIs can be a challenge. How what would you advise you know marketers to sort of how to balance that, how to get the business to prioritize? So I mean the know, the IPA learnings say you should have sixty percent of your marketing looking at brand or long term brand building and forty percent looking at activation and short term. And that is a shock to many of us. Again, because the digital stuff's so easy to um it's kind of so easy to measure and so it's so tempting to to increase that percentage. And and I mean there's been a lot of work done and in some categories that's even higher. It's 70, 80 percent um so I think the, the short answer to that is more than you would expect. Um, and it comes back to creating long term demand and thinking beyond the short term incentives we've put in place for people. You still want people to be looking for your brand in a year's time, in two years time. You want to be able to be harvesting the results of the work you're doing now um, in that long term. And that is why brand is incredibly important. Um, it is it is more important perhaps than even I think even marketers have lost sight of the importance of of brand work um and that yeah that that measurement is is longer it takes longer um it happens less frequently but it is an absolute predictor of what will happen in the short term and how efficiently and effectively you'll be able to harvest now okay we've come to the end of you know our discussion but i do have you know one or two maybe quick fire questions <laughs> so say whatever comes to mind immediately don't think about it um, so based on the marketing midlife crisis that we've just talked about, if the marketing industry were a person, what would their midlife outfit, as in clothes, look like? What would, what, what would they be so wearing? So definitely 
it would be something incredibly trendy. Um, I think it would be, unfortunately, like fast fashion. Um, because it's, I mean, marketing is, it's a cool industry to be in. But it, I think sometimes it can be too focused on the extrinsics. And a, a lot of the archetypes talk about how important it is to go back to the basics um, and stop stop trying to be so kind of fancy, stop trying to be so cool, stop trying to be the next big thing, lose the buzzwords and look at what is working in the business, which is the boring side of marketing. I mean, the kind of proper decision science of effectiveness in comms, effectiveness in advertising and effectiveness across the, the four Ps that you referred to earlier. Um, but that's what you should be doing. So it would be, it would be something very impractical and very trendy. <laughs> it, would, it would look great. It would look great. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it might not be fit for purpose. I like that. Really good answer. Gosh, thank you so much, Deborah, for your point of view, your thoughts um, on on shift, a marketing rethink. Really thank you so much. It was great to be today. here.